Baie welkom by Melk in jou teetijd en daar is niks beter as heerlijke kost nie. En um, dit is vir my een voorrecht om vandag met Nicole Neetling te gesels, al die pad van die kaap en sy specialiseer in Indiese kos en um, jylle gaan nou nou meer hoor van al haar dinge wat sy deurgegaan het, maar uh, wat vir my interessant was, sy was eers een prokureer voordat sy haar toega opgehang het vir een voorskoot. Nicole, so welcome um, to be with me today. I'm so excited to speak to you about your journey, about your story. Um, thank you for taking time out to speak to us today. Hi, it's a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I I can understand and I'm, I'm the, my first question is going to be, because lots of people going to ask me, why is your surname Netling? How did that happen? <laughs> So, so yeah. please tell me that story. <laughs> it's, it's a good story because someone once phoned me not knowing how I look and asked me to cater, the, uh, cater an Indian buffet for them. And at the end of wow. the conversation, they said, what does a Nietling know about making Indian food? <laughs> and I said, a little bit more <laughs> sure. than you think. <laughs> so yeah. so sure. I, I married my husband, Yaku Nietling, who comes from Durbanville. And hence, wow. you know, uh, was was uh, enjoined into the Nietling family. Okay. But how did you guys meet? Where did you get <clears throat> to know each other? So we were both sort of um, situated around the Stellenbosch Durbanville area. And at that time, my mom was leaving for Dubai and asked me to come and live um, in Durbanville with my sister. And during that time, okay. a friend of mine asked me, you know, don't I want to come and join their small group in Durbanville? And I said, no, I'm really based in Stellenbosch. You know, I don't want to, to spend more time yes. in Durbanville. Um, and Brachis, the day we put my sister on a plane <laughs> to go join my mom, I did have this feeling, sure, something's about to open up. It feels like space has been created in my life. And the same mm. friend says, listen, let's go drop off your sister and let's go to sell tonight. And I thought, oh, okay, well, why not? <laughs> um, and it was there that this, that this cute guy with the green eyes and this bright yellow um, sweater comes and says hello to me. And that was Yaku. And so we were friends for re- about racist history. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> but how, so, and then you've got three beautiful boys, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, I have three. Uh, I have Noah, Jonah, and Sammy. Um, and they're oh. such sweethearts. In fact, yeah, you, know, you will have to have them on the next time. Every time I do an interview, they go, Mama, did they want to speak to us as well? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do next time. <laughs> oh, so sweet. And but can I ask you if if you if you can if you want to, isn't it sometimes difficult that people maybe frown upon this because it's different cultures? Um, was it difficult for you, or was it easy? Um, how how was it? How were you accepted into his family that's mostly pro Afrikaans speaking yeah. and Afrikaner? You know. Good question. Um, I think, you know, I, I went to a white Catholic school from the time I was five years old. So I grew up a little bit like Moses. I, I feel like I, I belonged. I was educated. I was, you know, taught to be well-spoken. And then I came to Stellenbosch, you know, the land of Afrikaans and um, had a lot yes. of uh, uh, different friends from all over the, the world. And, and so I think my, my identity was, was quite solid and, and I was comfortable with other cultures. And okay. so I think Yaku had a, a few fears <laughs> when, when he was about to, to introduce me. And I remember actually one day um, in, in specific where we get to his mom's house and we see his uncle's car there. And he must have got such a fright <laughs> thinking, what are they going to say? That he sort of yes. made up a story saying, maybe they're sleeping, maybe we should go, maybe we should come back later. And uh, he obviously <laughs> saw my face drop to like this, oh, what? Sure. Um, mm. And I, I remember just saying, Sam Jace, you know what? No matter what other people think or feel, let's always enter a room expecting the best. Um, I've, I've spent time really trying to make sure that I can converse in Afrikaans. And when I walk in, they come, hello, um, really try and meet them on you know, a respectful level. So if we 
if we're meeting people of different cultures or your culture, let's go and expecting the best. Mm. Um, and sure. I think that's helped a lot in how we approach new uh, places we go to. We always just go and we be ourselves and we literally let God do the rest. And none of yes. his family has ever sort of shown any um, difference, you know, towards me. So I've been, I've been oh, very that, blessed. Yeah, that is, that is really a blessing. And, and I think it's also good because it teaches us to let go of all these boundaries and ideas and I, what that we do have, that we can just lay them down and love people for who they are. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and not to anticipate the negative, you know, um, yeah. to, to go in confidently and to go in respectfully and speak the person's language. And, and connect with the person where they're at and, and uh, you see the boundaries come come tumbling down from there yes now now you where did you grew up to, um before you uh, came to the lovely cape town <laughs> so oh where did i live yeah, where did you grow up? Where, where oh, you, where okay. you... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I grew up in um, Natal in Durban. <laughs> In a, in a oh, tiny lovely. Little, yes. So it's um, in a tiny little town called Tongat. Um, and I mm -hmm. went to school in, in, in Derbs. So it was a very, very different scenery. And uh, Fainbos is something that I had to grow to love. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. My, <laughs> my, father, my father loved Natal. He always sang that song, Groene is land van Natal. And I think if yes. he could have stayed there forever, he would have. But my mom yeah. said, no, it's too humid. She wants to go back to Pretoria. So um, that was our journey. So there's a little bit of a hard saw if I hear of Natal and Durban, because my dad loves Durban. So, yes. but were you, you weren't a Christian all your life. <clears throat> no, no. I grew up in a, a very Hindu household and family. Um, sure. So we, we learned about all the Hindu gods. We studied the Hindu scriptures. We went to the temples. We were, yeah, that was our worldview is that it was a, a, mm. a Hindu sort of community that, that we came from. So yes. very, very different to what we know now. Mm. And how did, how did you get to become a Christian? How, what happened there? So, you know, um, the, the Hindu, Hindu culture and the, is, is very rife in their spiritual life. So the supernatural is quite evident on a weekly basis. You know, you're not in any doubt that the supernatural exists. And uh, I was always one for, for just wanting more. I just want to know more. And if I knew this about the gods, and I wanted more of it. And I would, I would literally hide in the temples, like in this inner, inner court where, you know, only the priests are allowed. And I just, I just want to be closer to all of these gods. And there was a, a specific ceremony that we were having and everyone was dressed up and the, the music were going, the Indian instruments are, are quite, uh, you know, they're beautiful. And they were singing and the instruments were playing and people were worshiping, if I can use that word. And um, I just felt electricity in the air. And I thought today was the day I was going to engage with the supernatural life, like something was going to happen. I mean, I was 13 years old, but I thought fire was going to fall, like something amazing was going to happen. And the mm -hmm. priest goes into this, this tiny inner chamber. Um, and I thought when he comes out back into the, the hall where the rest of us are, that's when it was going to happen. And yes. so I waited as he went in. I thought, okay, here we go. And I sort of, I remember holding my breath. And as he came out, nothing happened. So. And I remember that feeling of such disappointment going, no, man, there's mm -hmm. got to be more than this. Why, why did I not experience anything? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, maybe there's a God I don't know. You know, I know there's mm -hmm. many gods. Maybe there's one that I don't know. Maybe he, he must just show me who he is. And I sort of put yes. that out there and I, I left it. Um, and at the same time, I was going to, a, like I mentioned, the Catholic school. And I go mm -hmm. back, we have mass once a month. And I go, go sit in mass and the priest starts preaching out of, out of the Bible. And I've been in the school for seven years. So I've been to seven years worth of, of mass. And that day when he spoke, something started stirring inside me. I mean, I can't remember what he said. Maybe he was saying something like, come follow me. 
And I, and I wanted to get up out of my chair and say, yes, I want to follow, but where are we going? Why, why isn't anyone else going? And I had this yeah. urge to, to stand up and, and, and respond. Um, and, and this kind of happened for a couple of months until the day my mom said, let's go to church. Would you want to come to church with me? And my mom was a staunch Hindu. Like, you couldn't tell her about Jesus. Mm. She only ever came to Mass when I was reading out of the Bible. You know, it was my turn to read the scriptures. Um, but you, you couldn't convert her. And so when my mom said, come to church with me, I was like, okay. I'm, I'm more intrigued <laughs> <laughs> myself than to question, question you right now. So we go to church, and it's a little bit more charismatic. Um, but again... When the pastor started preaching out of the word, I was just like moved. I was moved beyond beyond knowing what to do. And like all good mothers, she says, you know, go up for prayer afterwards. And I said, but I, I don't know what to pray for. In Hinduism, we have different gods and we have different mantras. And, you know, I don't need any of those things now. And in our Catholic church, we learn different prayers at different times of the day. So I go into this space going i don't i don't know what to say and so out of all these years of cumulative knowledge of all of these gods the best thing i could think of to say as i stood up there was hi god <laughs> <laughs> your turn <laughs> you <said> that's brilliant <laughs> yeah um and, and so i kind of stood there quite expecting for him to to respond or reply but out of the mm. corner of my eye, I see a pastor praying for people, and people are falling down. And I'm like, whoa, wait, wait a minute now. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing a dress. I'm 13 years old. Th this falling down is not going to work for me. <laughs> yes. You know, oh, I want to be here, and I just want to make yeah. myself strong so that I'm not going to be pushed over. Mm. Other half of my brain is telling me, you've seen more, you've seen other spiritual things happen. So mm -hmm. there, was, there was already this two-sided uh, image sort of going on in my mind. But uh, as, as the pastor came, came to me to pray for me, he was a meter away. So basically, he couldn't have touched me even if he reached out his hand. And I remember him saying, Father, I bring this daughter before you. And that was the last thing I remember. I was down on the floor, sobbing, weeping. I mean, not this... <laughs> You know, I could snort in Toronto, hey, I'll just on you. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't control it. I couldn't control it. I was like, I don't know why I'm sad. I'm not, I'm not sad. I can't stop crying. Yeah. And this went, wow. went on for a bit. And what I do remember, it was like the stirring that was inside of me, this has, was now finding its way out. And I remember it being the best, most wonderful cry I've, I've ever had. And a friend yeah. comes to me afterwards and she says, you know, are you okay? And I said, yeah, what happened? And she says, you've been touched by the Holy Spirit. And so mm -hmm. I said, no, I, I don't understand this. In Hinduism, yes. you have to do something and then you get, you get blessed for what you do. I haven't done anything. And she yeah. says, yeah, that's right. He has done everything for you and he's chosen you. Mm -hmm. And so, and so there I have my supernatural encounter with this other God that I thought I knew but mm. didn't really know. And I was like, that's it. I want to know more of you. I yeah. want to know more about you. Sure. And it wasn't easy for you guys, I believe. That no. Because your mom, you guys were in a Hindu, your mom was in a Hindu marriage or married to your that's dad right. that was a Hindu. Yeah. 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 So sure. I think I think maybe God knew that both my mom and I had to have a real, a very real encounter with the Lord. And apparently, my mom had one uh, about two months before I did. Um, so when we finally spoke to my dad, uh, he said that we, if we believed this this new God, we we would have to leave, or we could go back to the way things were, and then we could stay. And mm -hmm. and I think once you've had an encounter, a real encounter with, with Jesus, there is just no turning back. And so we decided, we said, okay, let's go. <clears throat> and wow. uh, so we, we packed literally one bag each. My mom left her house, her clothes, her jewelry, um, her everything. And uh, we walked out the door. But I'll never forget, as we, as we walked out, my mom told me, 
something that I'll, I'll never forget. She said, you walked out of your earthly father's house, but you've walked into your heavenly father's kingdom and you were once wow. for nothing. Wow. Sure. Uh, and, and that has sort of amazing. been my motivation my whole life. Mm, that is so, <clears throat> and that's, that's, that's exactly what it is, hey? Wow. Um, I just quickly, because I know the time is going to run out, because it's such an amazing um, story that you actually went and studied law yes. and you became an attorney. <clears throat> and, um, <laughs> and, and now you're not an attorney anymore. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, so so the, the, the short story is that, uh, you know, I worked in a, I loved what I did. Um, had, I was a patent attorney, but I worked for a couple of years for a firm in Cape Town. And though it seemed ideal, it seemed like I had the office and I had the view and I had the paycheck and the high heels. Um, mm -hmm. I got to a point where I looked out the window and thought, is this it? Is this all my life is going to be from now on? You know, the mm. files, the going to court, the meeting with clients. Is, is this it? Maybe in 10 years' time, I'll have a bigger house and a bigger car. But I, I can't imagine that this is all that life has to offer. And so I started mm. asking the Lord. I was like, Lord, what is there more for us? Mm. And uh, then I felt pregnant with my first son. And Yaku and I both started asking the Lord questions. And the answer that came to both of us was that I can stop working. And to give you context, Yaku was earning less than our rent at the time. So it feasibly sure. didn't sound right. But we both believed that this is what this is what God wanted us to do. And like you yeah. know my story. I've 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 been yeah. through worse. So like it all preached me for this moment to say, you know what, Lord, it's fine. And I resigned, stopped working, we scaled down completely to a two bedroom flat. And in that flat, I asked the Lord, what now? And I came across the story of Elijah, who was hungry in the desert, and how God takes him to the widow and says, she'll feed you and, and give you a place to stay. And when Elijah gets there, the widow says, I've only got a bit of flour and a bit of oil. And if I use it, we're going to die. There's no one else to provide sure. for us. And Elijah tells her, listen, I trust the God who sent me here. I know he'll take care of you. So please make it. And as the story goes, the flour and oil never ran out. Mm. And I was like, Lord, I'd love a miracle like that. I would love you to multiply something of mine. And immediately mm. I felt the Lord said, but next, what do you have? What's your flour and oil? And I said, well, I love people. I love cooking. I love teaching. And at the stage, I was the only Indian person in Paul. So everybody was lining up to come and have curry at our house. <laughs> so we said, let's, let's see if we can do something with this. And, mm -hmm. and so literally, uh, we started inviting people into our house and teaching them how to make food the way my mom did. No mm -hmm. um, culinary skills needed. It was just cooking together. And the sure. first time we did it, I realized these strangers are coming in. We're cooking together. We're, having, we're making a meal. We're discovering each other's backgrounds, families. Something special mm -hmm. happens. You connect with people. Mm -hmm. And I think that day, uh, I'm going to show you now, Flour and Oil was born. It's the brand of my, it's my company name. Um, and mm. and every time I, I meet with people, I tell them this is where it started. This is how Flour and Oil began. And, you know, from then we have partnered with um, wine farms, bed and breakfast companies. We've done team building. We've done spice of your marriage courses. And in 2018, <laughs> we had the privilege of standing in Basel, Switzerland, to give our very first mm. international flower oil course. And I remember sure. telling them, I said, guys, you don't understand. I still, I'm still not driving my SLK or live in a mansion. I still just have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. But the Lord hasn't let it run out. He has multiplied yeah. it. Um, it's, such, it's such an amazing miracle. Right? You got your miracle. <laughs> Absolutely. Completely, completely. <laughs> It's such a, you know, what's about your story is that you asked the Lord, and I think at that time you didn't know you were speaking to the Lord, that you asked him that he will show you, you know, that have that connection with you um, when you were little, when you're 13 years old, and he answered your prayer. Yeah. And you didn't even knew it. You didn't even knew you were praying. And again, yeah. he answered your prayer and with this, this flower and oil where you just had this, what you had. And, um, and I think that is such um, a necessary 
a word that people need to hear in this day that Absolutely. God will answer your prayer. You have, you just have to have that faith that He will <clears throat> yeah. do it, Ab no matter Absolutely. how it looks. Yes, you know, uh, after my miracle, I said, well, you know, if God can do it in biblical times, and if God can do it for me, then surely He can do it for everyone who attends one of my courses. Surely that is the possibility is there. And so I, I encourage people, I say, go and find your flower and oil. Go find what are those, what's the thing in your hand that God can multiply for you? Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the, I almost want to say the, the, the trigger of the multiplication came, came in my life when I just obeyed the small steps God gave me. So, so my, my fire under the flower and oil is just the daily obedience in what God is telling mm. you. Wow, that's such a beautiful lyric. <laughs> the fire is your wow that's a beautiful lyric Thank you. <laughs> i think i'm gonna i'm gonna take it to make a song <laughs> please do please do keep, my, my my theme this year is that god is not looking for great acts of faith he's just looking for small steps of obedience mm, so wow full stop the, mm -hmm. like that is if, if no one remembers me for anything else it's that it's just sure. keep taking mm -hmm. small steps of faith uh, small acts of obedience. And and the funny yes. thing is when people look at it from the outside, they see great acts of faith. But actually, mm. it's just your daily obedience of the Lord. Daily sure. being in His Word, daily being obedient. Yeah, remarkable results. Wow. Um, Nicole, I see you You speak to yourself at Nix or um, how God speaks to you. But I yes. feel I want to say Nix, it was lovely meeting you was lovely speaking with you and you also you were really you you spoke to me this today so thank you for that and um i would love to meet you in person soon um yes i'm, I'm just asking my husband that we can permanently go to cape town <laughs> soon <Come on. laughs> and but I, yes. I really want just to say and pray over you that that you will inspire more people and that that um he will use you even in a way you haven't thought of yet. And wow. that's, that's what I pray for you. Come and on, thank, thank you again you. for your time. And, oh, um, thank your... you. Can I leave one last <laughs> word with you? Yes, um, please. <laughs> my, my slogan at um, my business, but it's my life slogan, is that every interaction matters. Um, Elijah was poor, destitute and hungry, and yet he created a miracle with the, with the widow. And I just want to say and encourage you that your interaction with people matters. You often encounter people that I will never meet. You encounter people from all over different um, places. Just know that your interaction matters to them and that you have the ability to create miracles in other people's lives. That's so true. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for is, that. It's a huge pleasure. Be blessed. And I really hope, uh, yeah, we get to see you either on this side <laughs> or on your side of the world. <laughs> I mean, preach it, sister, preach it. <laughs> da sy, <laughs> baie dankie jylle sabo tot ons gekyk het en dat jylle um, ons story geluister het vandag in Engels. Jylle sal sien, dit maak die saak nie, die Heere kom bedien in enige taal en hy praat met enige iemand wat net oop is om te hoor dat hy hulle lief het en dat daar doel is vir hulle op hierdie aarde en gebruik dit wat jy het, wat jy in jou hand het, gebruik dit om die koninkryk van die Heere te bevorder. Tot de volgende keer, tot ziens!